Hello everybody, this is uh, Dr. Nadeem and we are with Neelam Path Lectures, the Pursue series. This is our YouTube channel where all the old vi uh, videos are available and they are uploaded regularly. You can see them as and when you want. We have a Telegram group, you can join the group. It will help you in accessing all lecture related information. We have a Google Drive where the PDF of all lectures are uploaded. A master integration key which coordinates between the Google Drive and the YouTube channel. These are the disclaimers and we are with phase 3 which is recorded pathology lectures and the topic of the day today is pursue 1W which is uropathology and we are dealing with epithelial tumors of prostate, intraductal carcinoma, ductal adenocarcinoma and the rest. And to talk on that we have Dr. Mitadru Deshorkar who is an MBBS from JIPMAR, MD from JIPMAR. He is a consultant histopathologist at Dr. Lal Path Kolkata Reference Lab, consultant histo and cytopathologist at Calcutta Heart Clinic and Hospital, consultant histopathologist at Wisdom Pathology Lab, a dermatopathology specialty unit. He has been an ex-assistant professor in the Department of Pathology at SMV Medical College and Hospital and as an ex-consultant pathologist at SRL Diagnostics Fortis. He has authored a book which is Brain Tumors and Pathology which is available on Amazon and there is a Kindle version of that, highly recommended. So I would request Dr. Mitadru Deshwarkar to start his lecture on the intraductal carcinoma, ductal adenocarcinoma and the rest of the tumors of the prostate. Over to you Dr. Mitadru Deshwarkar. Thank you so much. Hello and welcome to this discussion. We now continue with uh, the discussion on the epithelial tumors of the prostate where we talk about the less common entities that is intraductal carcinoma, ductal adenocarcinoma and some of the even less common entities like uh, neuroendocrine carcinomas and carcinomas with squamous differentiation. Talking about the intraductal carcinoma of the prostate, in short IDCP, uh, we'll first have an understanding of what it stands for looking at the ESOP definition of this particular entity. So the definition which is established by ESOP states the fact that there is already an existing cancer, there is already an existing acinar carcinoma or in some cases ductal carcinoma and it has spread into the pre-existing prostatic ducts and acini and resulted in the distension. So that's the snapshot that you get of this particular entity looking at the definition. And as a result, it follows that most of the cases of intraductal carcinoma of prostate will be associated with already existing acinar carcinomas or in some cases ductal carcinomas. So the association is that most of the times when you make a diagnosis of IDCP, you will most likely have coexistent high-grade adenocarcinoma. Uh, and uh, this is important because if you do not have adenocarcinoma in the biopsy sample where you have diagnosed IDCP, it is a likely indication for asking for a rebiopsy because in that case, the clinician might have missed the original cancer. Uh, histologically, it kind of looks like a GPIN, that is high-grade prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia, although there are important differences between the two as far as the histology is concerned. We shall be seeing that subsequently. And even the molecular genetic profile is slightly different in that the the various genetic abnormalities like the loss of P10 gene or CDH1 or ERG gene fusions and loss of the, the P10 protein expression are commoner in the case of IDCP and these are shared genetic profiles which they share with the SINR adenocarcinoma. These are not seen in the case of AGPIN and loss of both the alleles of BRCA2 is also an important association that you see in the case of IDCP. However, it has still not come into diagnostic I mean, utility. Uh, most of the times, you will get this particular entity in the peripheral zone, where again, it's a common site for SNR carcinomas. Microscopy. Now, that's the most important part of this discussion because we would like to know the histological features by which you can kind of home down onto this particular entity. So firstly, you have expanded glands in which case uh, in uh, I mean both the ducts as well as the acini which are expanded by this infiltrate of atypical cells with a dense cribriform and solid architecture. Now there's uh, a little bit of understanding as far as the dense cribriform and solid architecture is concerned. You will have to visualize it as you read the definition. Imagine a dilated duct or an acinus in which you have more cells than the cribriform spaces. That is more than 50% of the gland is occupied by cells and towards the periphery or the center, you get these sponged out spaces, but these spaces cannot be the 
primary finding in the dilated gland. It has to be mostly cells along with a secondary component of the cribriform spaces. So that's your dense cribriform and solid architecture, which is definitional diagnostic finding that you get in the case of IDCP. And some textbooks say that this has to be found in at least six of the glands, adjacent glands. Uh, although in most of the cases, we'll find them in a larger number of glands. <clears throat> now, what if you do not have a dense cribriform and solid architecture? Because the definition also allows for a slightly less cellular, loose cribriform pattern or a micropapillary architecture. In that case, you will have to have either high-grade nuclei or most importantly, necrosis within the particular gland, that is comedonecrosis. And this should not be random. It should be seen in quite a few of the dilated glands. Basal cell layers, again, as the name suggests, interactal carcinoma, so basal cell layers should be preserved, but most, but often you will not be able to visualize it with your naked eye, and you will have to utilize a combination of high molecular weight keratin along with P63 in order to establish that there is at least a patchy preservation of the basal cell layer. Uh, IHC wise, these cells usually, uh, I mean, usually overexpress AMECAR, just like in the case of prostatic SNR carcinomas, and nuclear ERG expression can be seen in a subset of cases. So the first picture is what I mean by the dense cribriform pattern, as in the dilated, within the dilated glands, you see that there are more cells than the cribriform spaces. So it's tightly packed with cells, resulting in a predominantly solid appearance towards the center, but towards the periphery, you have got this cribriform spaces, overall giving rise to a solid dense cribriform pattern. Now this particular pattern that you see in the first image is diagnostic of IDCP. And as you can imagine, this, will lead to a differential diagnostic issue with a pattern for SNR carcinoma, in which case the IHC for high molecular weight keratin and P63 becomes very important. Now, moving on to the lower images, let's see the image number C. You see that the, again, you have got a dilated duct or an SNS, and at the same time, you have got a cribriform architecture along with a slightly solid proliferation of cells, but this, in this dilated duct, the proliferation of the cells is not that conspicuous. So this is what you mean by the loose cribriform pattern. And of course, in the image number D, you have this micropapillary architecture. Now, these two patterns can be seen in the case of IDCP, but in that case, you will have to have either high-grade atypia, that is the cells which are a part of this dilated duct should have at least six times nucleomegaly along with hyperchromasia, et cetera, compared to the adjacent normal, <clears throat> normal prosthetic cells. Excuse me. <clears throat> or they should have comedonecrosis. Now, in this particular case, you see that the entire duct lobular unit, the duct SNR unit is expanded and it's expanded to a pretty large size. And within these expanded ducts in the SNI, you see that it's mostly a solid proliferation of cells, thus establishing a predominantly solid architecture towards the center. But towards the periphery, you have got these properly punched out cribriform spaces. So that's your dense cribriform pattern, which is more or less diagnostic of an IDCP. Of course, you will need to substantiate it by using P63 and HMWK. So this is your dense cribriform pattern. And as this image shows, in this particular dilated ducts, you have the dense cribriform pattern, and at the same time, you also have the additional finding of comedonecrosis, which is also an important diagnostic finding in such cases. In the image on the right-hand side, you see that the pattern is mostly loose cribriform along with the micropapillary architecture. You have got a dilated duct, but what sets these things apart is that you have got a significant amount of nuclear pleomorphism as well, and probably some amount of comedonecrosis towards the center. So this is an IDCP as well. Now, if you go to the WHO, site, if you have access to the online WHO version, you see that the virtual case that they have put over there does not really have that dense cribriform pattern in that you have got the dilated ducts in the SNI, but it is predominantly punched out cribriform spaces throughout the dilated ducts. So in that case, we'll have to give importance to other softer findings, which will add up to your diagnosis of IDCP, as in you will have to have nuclear pleomorphism. And at the same time, you also have to look for the comedonecrosis. So together, Although you are not having that classical dense cribriform pattern, together the presence of pleomorphism and the comedonecrosis establishes the diagnosis of an IDCP within these dilated ducts. So this is the comedonecrosis that you should be watching out for. Now, as you see, this can lead to a differential diagnostic issue with either pattern four 
or in those cases in which the dilated ducts have got the comedone necrosis at the center with a pattern 5 SNR carcinoma. Again, the utilization of high molecular weight keratin and P63 to establish the at least focal presence of the basal cells within these dilated ducts and SNI is diagnostically important to segregate the two. So you can, yeah, I mean, you could do all that with the PIN4 cocktail. I have taken it uh, from a textbook, but in most of the cases, we shall not have access to the PIN4. But uh, PIN4, I mean, cocktail helps us to, uh, you know, get a kind of a snapshot of what is actually happening inside these dilated ducts. So if you look at the PIN4 image in this particular case, you see that <clears throat> the atypical cells within the dilated ducts are overexpressing amacar, which is labeled with red. And at the same time, the outer layer of basal cells, which is picked up by the combination of P63 and the high molecular weight keratin, is positive in all of these dilated ducts. So this is not a pattern for SNR carcinoma because the basal cell layer is preserved. So you see the dilated ducts as well as the SNI, both, and in both you see the partially preserved basal cell layer component. In this particular case, again with a PIN4 cocktail, you see that there are dilated SNI as well as dilated ducts. And in both the cases, the cells are overexpressing amacar, but at the same time, also expressing the basal cell layer at the periphery. So this is not an invasive carcinoma. This is a <clears throat> this is an interactal carcinoma of the prostate. However, as I've already said, in most of the cases, interactal carcinoma will be associated with a component of coexistent SNR or in some cases, ductal carcinoma. In this case, as you see, within the dilated duct of IDCP, along with that, in the, uh, in, the, in the adjacent stroma, you have these small, small trabeculae and ill-formed glandular aggregates of the SNR carcinoma, which are overexpressing amacar, but are not expressing the basal cell markers. So these are the essential and the desirable diagnostic features as far as the WHO is concerned. You have to have an expansive epithelial proliferation. You have to have lumen spanning solid cribriform and or comedo patterns. And the desirable feature is that at least you should have some amount of IHC markers available in order to establish the presence of basal cell layer. Now, uh, as I've already said, IDCP is oftentimes associated with invasive prostate cancer. So if your biopsy sample uh, has IDCP and does not have a component of prostatic SNR carcinoma, it is high time to call up the urologist and say that probably you'll need to do a rebiopsy because there is usually a strong association of high grade and high stage prostatic carcinomas with IDCP and that might have been missed. Uh, in the case of radical prostatectomies, the presence of IDCP usually correlates with a higher tumor grade, larger volume of tumor along with spread beyond the prostate and invasion of the seminal vesicles and spread to the pelvic nodes. The most important uh, uh, take home message of this particular slide is that what I've already said, in case if you get an IDCP on your needle biopsy, you will have to counsel the clinician that this is probably a missed out high volume prostate cancer. In the case of IDCP, which is present in the case of prostatic biopsies, these have been strongly associated with early biochemical recurrence, uh, lower cancer specific survival period, increased incidence of distant mets and after radiation therapy, metastatic failure. That is metastasis happening even after radiation therapy. Now, coming to the differential diagnosis, uh, uh, actually, in this present day, the range of differential diagnosis has got narrowed because what we used to call the cribriform HGPIN is now slowly being recognized as probably a partially sampled IDCP and this get a new terminology coming into the IDCP spectrum. However, in some cases, the presence of a purely micro micropapillary pattern might lead to some amount of differential diagnostic issue with a high-grade prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia. And sometimes a ductal adenocarcinoma could mimic the cases of IDCP. But again, if you follow strict definitional guidelines as far as histology is concerned, you will probably not make a mistake. Uh, coming to AGPIN, usually the number of glands which are involved by AGPIN are few not as many as you see in the case of IDCP. And usually those glands are small, no distension whatsoever with a smooth smooth contour. Unlike the large, grotesquely distended and uh, our glands as well as the ducts and the SNI with a kind of an irregular 
uh, irregular architecture that you see in the case of IDCP. So the dense cribriform solid architecture in the case of IDCP is not seen in the case of high-grade prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia. Also, there is usually no significant atypia or comedonecrosis. And as far as the ductal adenocarcinoma is concerned, you will have to look at the usual, you will have to look for the usual features of ductal adenocarcinoma, that is the papillary, proper papillary architecture with a fibrovascular core, along with the lining of pseudostratified atypical columnar cells with elongated appearance. Uh, use of basal cell markers, although very diagnostically useful, remember that in some cases of ductal adenocarcinoma, you might have patchy preservation of the residual basal cells. So that's an important thing to be kept in mind. So coming to the differential diagnosis, again, if you follow a flowchart approach, as uh, you will probably be able to segregate all these entities. First, utilize HMWCK and P63 in combination and establish whether the basal cells are present or not. If you do not have basal cells, obviously you're dealing with an invasive carcinoma. In case if the basal cell layer is present, look for whether you are having the dense cribriform pattern. Which, uh, uh, which we have already defined. If you have that, definitely you have got interactal carcinoma. In case, if you do not have that, look for significant amount of nuclear pleomorphism. Again, if it is present, interactal carcinoma again. If you do not have that much of ATP, I'll look for comedonecrosis, which thus becomes a very important diagnostic feature. If it is present, again, it's interactal carcinoma. Now, if none of these findings are present and you are having glands which are dilated, with a slightly loose cribriform pattern plus minus micropapillary architecture. This could be an HGPIN, but in case if there is some amount of atypia, you will utilize this terminology of atypical interductal proliferation. So this is a proper WHO endorsed entity, and this is finding more and more diagnostic use, and the diagnosis of cribriform HGPIN is slowly getting replaced by this atypical interductal proliferation. And as far as the biopsy is concerned, your diagnosis of interductal carcinoma or atypical interductal proliferation oftentimes has the same clinical implication as we shall subsequently see. So this is taken from a textbook, which is authored by Dr. Uh, by Dr. Rajal Shah. And uh, this kind of gives the current diagnostic approach as far as this range of entities is concerned, that is either IDCP or AIP. So, any of these two, if you have in prostatic biopsy, the first dictum that is followed as per this book and as per the endorsement by GUPS, we shall be talking about this subsequently, is that you do not need to grade the IDCP component. Just make a presence, uh, I mean, just make a note of the presence of IDCP within the prostatic biopsy. What are the various scenarios that can arise? So if you have IDCP along with an existing SNR carcinoma, look for the grade of the of the SNR carcinoma that you have given. If the grade is more than or equal to eight, that is you already have pattern four and pattern five architecture, the presence of IDCP or the mention of IDCP will not probably make much difference because you are already dealing with a higher grade group disease. But still, it is recommended to report IDCP in such cases as there might be an additional prognostic value. However, if you have got a lower grade SNR carcinoma, that is grade six or seven, then definitely you will need to mention the presence of the interactal carcinoma because as I've already said, interactal carcinoma is usually associated with high grade and high stage disease. And you will have to make a note about its poor prognostic significance in the report. <clears throat> what in case if you have IDCP and if you do not have a existing, uh, I mean, existing SNR carcinoma within the biopsy sample, as I've already said, this is a strong indication that the clinician might have missed the actual cancer. So in this case, you have to report it and at the same time advise an immediate rebiopsy. And what about the diagnosis of this AIP, that is atypical interactal proliferation? It has got the same clinical significance. You will have to recommend immediate repeat biopsy in case, uh, in, uh, in case the existing prostatic cancer, uh, like cancer has been inadvertently not sampled. <clears throat> Now, as far as the endorsement of the genitourinary pathology society is concerned, this is the same endorsement. You will need to make a note of the presence of interactal carcinoma in your prostatic biopsy, but you do not need to add it to the final Gleason score. So keep that in mind, but also keep in mind that since most of us will be reporting or trying to follow the reporting protocol of CAP, 
As far as CAP is concerned, it gives an option of incorporating interactal carcinoma into your final Gleason grade. And this is something which is finding more and more favor with those who practice reporting their biopsies by the CAP format. So how would you incorporate the finding of IDC within your final Gleason score? Because as you know, you are dealing with apples and oranges here. In the case of IDC, you are having a preserved basal cell layer, while in the case of SNR carcinoma, you do not. So the established rules which we know about Gleason scoring system all apply to the SNR carcinomas. There is no such framework which is established in the case of IDC. But if you look through the articles, you will find that there are articles which talk about how to incorporate your IDC component into the final Gleason score. And the principle is pretty simple. But of course, keep in mind that you will have to have IHC access because in order to differentiate those glands of IDCP from your SINR carcinoma, you will need to establish the presence or the absence of the basal cell layer. If you have access to I, uh, I mean, to these IHCs, you will look at the architecture basically. So as I have said, in most of the cases, IDC will have a dense cribriform pattern. So it would get a Gleason pattern four. However, if you have comedone necrosis, you will make it a pattern five. And that's how you will incorporate the IDC component into your final Gleason score. If you are following the CAP reporting format, that is. Now that was all about IDCP. We now move on to the next entity, which is prostatic ductal adenocarcinoma. Now ductal adenocarcinomas by definition are composed of tall papillary structures. Along with, always remember, there is often time a complex cribriform component within prostatic ductal carcinomas. And that is one of the reasons why it comes as a differential diagnosis of interactal carcinoma of the prostate. However, the lining is characteristically by tall columnar pseudostratified epithelial cells, which is not seen in the case of IDCP. They usually, they oftentimes present in an identical manner to SINR carcinomas, but keep this fact in mind that of the, of the prostatic cancers, this particular type of prostatic cancer has got a tendency to protrude into the urethra and basically not look like a cancer. So to the clinician, sometimes it might even look like a urethral polyp, but actually it turns out to be a ductal adenocarcinoma. So these are the central types which usually involve the prostatic urethra and the larger prostatic ducts. You have also got the peripheral type of prostatic ductal adenocarcinoma, which happens in the standard peripheral zone, which is affected in the case of SNR carcinomas. Also, the PSA levels are significant in that they're highly variable. They could be high, but in, but in many cases, they turn out to be lower than in SNR carcinomas. And as far as the metastatic potential is concerned, apart from the usual sites like the lymph nodes and bone, they have got a very strong predilection for spreading to the unusual sites like lungs, liver, and especially to organs like the penis and the testis. Now, these are very unusual sites for METs as far as the prostatic cancer is concerned. But in the case of ductal adenocarcinoma, these are known sites for METs. And also keep in mind that in most of the cases, this particular subtype will be associated with SNR adenocarcinoma. So be very careful before making a diagnosis of prostatic ductal adenocarcinoma. In fact, you should not make the diagnosis as far as the needle biopsy is concerned. We shall be, uh, we shall be touching on that particular point subsequently. And this is often associated with high-grade prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia. Now, as far as the microscopy is concerned, as I've already said, you will get tall true papillae with fibrovascular cores, also a component of cribriform glands, and sometimes even a solid pattern mixed up. And uh, these are lined by pseudostratified tall columnar cells, and oftentimes they will grow within existing, pre-existing ducts, which will retain the native basal cell layer, thus leading to a differential diagnostic issue with the IDCP. These, by definition, are grade four. However, if you have comedone necrosis in the setting, of course, the rules which we know in the case of SNR carcinoma apply, and then it becomes a grade five. <coughs> Sorry. As I've already said, since these are often mixed up with a component of prostatic SNR carcinoma, if you get even a, what looks like a purely ductal adenocarcinoma on, uh, on a biopsy, do not make the diagnosis of ductal adenocarcinoma. Instead, sign out your report with the diagnosis of adenocarcinoma of prostate with ductal features, because you don't know what's going to come. Uh, I mean, what's going to come out in your radical prostatectomy specimen. And in the case of radical prostatectomy specimen, at least fifty percent of the tumor has to have a ductal morphology. 
but in majority of the cases, you see that there's a pretty substantial proportion of SNR adenocarcinoma. So this will be oftentimes signed out as SNR adenocarcinoma with the mention of the ductal component. Uh, as far as the IHC is concerned, again, since it arises from the prostate, it will, be, it will express most kinds of prostatic markers. Although keep in mind that PSA expression can be sometimes focal and weak. NKX 3.1, which is a nuclear marker, usually shows strong retained expression. So that's a very good marker to utilize as far as a differential diagnostic issue of a prostatic ductal adenocarcinoma versus a MEDS from the colorectal carcinoma is concerned. These also express amecar, And most of the times they will lack a basal cell there, but do keep in mind that patchy positivity for P63 or high molecular weight keratin can be seen in cases of ductal adenocarcinoma. So the established rule of total absence of Basal cell layer, which we have studied in the case of SNR carcinoma, does not uh, I mean does not exist in the case of ductal adenocarcinomas. And another important thing, as far as the metastatic workup is concerned, you will probably utilize a combination of CK7 and CK20. As we have already seen in the case of prostatic SNR carcinoma, these are dual negative for CK720. However, in the case of ductal adenocarcinomas, there can be patchy CK20 positivity, thus again leading to a differential diagnostic issue with colorectal carcinoma sometimes. Now, as far as the histology architecture goes, I usually refer to Fletcher for the, uh, for the approach to ductal adenocarcinomas because it summarizes the entire histology of the, uh, of the ductal adenocarcinomas in a great way. It basically talks about two types of ductal carcinomas. First is the type A pattern, which you usually see in the centrally located adenocarcinomas of the duct, as in having a purely papillary pattern. On the other hand, if you go towards the peripheral zone of the prostate, you will find that the, if the smaller ducts are involved, the architecture along with the papillary component starts to also develop into a very prominent cribriform and sometimes solid architecture. So that's the pattern B. So the, the pattern A, so in case if your ductal adenocarcinoma presents as a urethral polyp query, you will more often get this kind of a histology and towards the periphery, you will get a mixed papillary and a cribriform morphology. Oftentimes, it's a combination of both. So the characteristic finding is the, the papilla with the fibrovascular core, which is lined by pseudostratified columnar epithelium. So let's see a few of these virtual cases. Again, sometimes the papillae might be so closely packed that you will not be able to appreciate the papillary architecture as such, but then again, if you look at the fibrovascular cores towards the center of it, you know that you are dealing with a papillary morphology. And again, if you look at the lining of this papillae, you are having this pseudostratified columnar epithelial lining. Again, because of this combination of papillary architecture, which can sometimes look, look viliform along with the pseudostratified columnar look, you will sometimes have a differential diagnostic issue with a metastatic carcinoma, adenocarcinoma from the colon or from the rectum. In this particular case, towards the right, you have got this characteristic papillae lined by the pseudostratified columnar epithelial cells. But as you move towards the center, you have a cribriform component as well, a smaller cribriform component mixed up with the papillary component. And then you have got interluminal comedo necrosis as well. So you are dealing with a pattern five architecture here. So these are your characteristic papillae that you see with the fibrovascular course. Sometimes the course will be sectioned in a transverse orientation and you will not be able to see them in a linear fashion, rather see them as these rounded outlines. Okay, so these are the transversely sectioned papillae of a ductal adenocarcinoma. So if you have a close-up look, you see that again, there's this slender fibrovascular core towards the center of the papilla. Towards the left, you have got this characteristic ductal adenocarcinoma morphology with the papilla with the lining. However, towards the right, you see that along with that, you also have a cribriform pattern. So you get a combination of papillary along with cribriform architecture in the case of ductal adenocarcinomas. Again, sometimes they'll be very closely packed. And as you can see, you can make out a lining of the prostatic urethra in this particular case where my pointer is. So this is a more centrally located ductal adenocarcinoma with a purely papillary morphology. As you can see, these papillae are coalescent, but again, you can spot the cores. This is a nice perineural invasion with the nerve caught in transverse section in a ductal adenocarcinoma. Now, coming to the usual discussion on our PIN4 cocktail, again, 
So you will need to assimilate all the facts that, that we have already discussed. We know that these cells will overexpress amacar, And at the same time, there can be patchy retention of the basal cell layer markers, that is P63, and the high molecular weight keratin. So if you look at these images towards the left, you see that most of the uh, I mean, most of the papillae are devoid of the basal cell layer lining and only overexpress amacar. However, the case in the right is expressing in a patchy fashion basal cell layers markers. Okay, so don't be surprised if you get a patchy basal cell positivity in a case of ductal adenocarcinoma. Now, this is from one of our own cases. Uh, uh, this case has been put up only for showing the fact that you, you can sometimes get these patchy basal markers. So this was again a prostatic ductal adenocarcinoma with a characteristic histology of the papillary pattern with the pseudostratified lining. And as you see, this papillary, uh, I mean, this ductal adenocarcinoma had grown into priorly existing dilated prostatic ducts. And PSA showed patchy positivity within the lining. However, NKX 3.1 came out in a much stronger and diffuse fashion. MACR was overexpressed by the cells. CK7 was negative as expected, but as I've already said, some of these cells can express CK20. So they did in this particular case. And again, high molecular weight cytokeratin was focally positive, but that does not alter the diagnosis of a prostatic ductal adenocarcinoma. P63 was negative in this case. Uh, another dictum that I've already talked about is that you will usually oftentimes get a combination of SNR carcinoma along with uh, adenocarcinoma with, with ductal features, and that is why you will not utilize the diagnosis of ductal adenocarcinoma on a, on a needle biopsy. In this particular case, if you see towards the left, you have got a conventional ductal adenocarcinoma morphology, while towards the right, you have got this characteristic SINR morphology. So this is something with a mixed SINR and ductal features. See the characteristic ducts towards the left and the SNI, the atypical SNI towards the right. Okay, so you see the atypical SNI at the bottom and the atypical ductal papillae towards the top. This is another case where again, you have this atypical ductal proliferation, that is the atypical ductal adenocarcinoma component towards the left and the SNR adenocarcinoma component on the right. So the characteristic papillae lined by the pseudostratified columnar cells towards the left and towards the right, you have got the classic SNR adenocarcinoma with mostly pattern three glands. Now, as far as the clinical significance is concerned, ductal adenocarcinoma has got a tendency to spread into the prostatic duct. So oftentimes you will find them associated with interactal carcinoma of the prostate. Uh, if it is present in a radical prostatectomy specimen, these usually correlate with advanced disease, that is with spread into the seminal vesicle and spread beyond the prostate. And usually involves the lymph nodes and bones, just as you get in the case of conventional SNR carcinoma. But additionally, like I've already said, they metastasize to, uh, to the visceral organs like lungs and liver, and sometimes to brain, skin, penis, or, or testes, which are very unusual sites for involvement by SNR carcinoma. In such cases, if it spreads to the penile urethra, you will oftentimes have a differential diagnostic issue with a penile with, uh, I mean, with a primary penile urethral carcinoma. Now, uh, these are often understaged at the time of biopsy. That's another thing to be kept in mind. And uh, most importantly, in a prostatic carcinoma with a significant ductal adenocarcinoma component, even if you give androgen deprivation therapy, these patients will again present with metastatic disease. And oftentimes, that disease presents with a neuroendocrine kind of a morphology. We shall be talking about that subsequently. Now, as far as the differential diagnosis is concerned, as we already know, a GPIN can present with a micropapillary and a cribriform architecture, but usually they will not have those tall columnar stratified cells. They will usually not have the confluent growth of the atypical uh, of the atypical papillae that we see in the case of a ductal adenocarcinoma. They will lack comedonecrosis, mitosis, or significant degree of nuclear atypia. And the basal cell layer is usually present. And although it may be in a I mean, present in a patchy or in a fragmented fashion. The more important uh, thing to be ruled out is a secondary spread from a colonic or a rectal adenocarcinoma. Now, if you have dirty necrosis, uh, and of course, you will have to utilize a combination of immunohistochemical markers. So you will use a combination of PSA along with MKX 3.1. 
And on the other side, in order to rule out a colonic adenocarcinoma, you will use beta catenin uh, and the CDX2 and most importantly, SATB2. And of course, CK7 and 20 will also help to a certain extent because if you have negative CK7 and a strong CK20 positivity, you are most you are more likely dealing with a rectal or a colonic adenocarcinoma. Uh, a prostatic urethral polyp could be sometimes a differential diagnostic issue if you have a centrally located ductal adenocarcinoma. Uh, urethral carcinomas involving the prostatic ducts and the SNI could sometimes have a papillary and a cubiform pattern, but there again, you have got urethral markers to help you out versus the prostatic markers. And lastly, this is the most important thing to be kept in mind, especially by those who are starting out in the field of genital urinary pathology. And this is a mistake oftentimes made by us when we start out. We mistake the seminal vesicle, especially sometimes uh, inadvertently targeted. Uh, I mean, needle, needle biopsy might have sampled a portion of the seminal vesicle. And in that case, there is a tendency to call this a uh, prostatic ductal adenocarcinoma by mistake you will sometimes appreciate a kind of a papillary morphology, but then again, look at this characteristic pigment, the characteristic lipofuscin pigment that you see within these lining epithelial cells. So that is characteristic of the seminal vesicle. Okay, so in seminal vesicle ductus difference, you usually get this kind of a pigment that will never be seen in the case of a ductal adenocarcinoma. And the striking thing is the significant range of atypia that you get in the case of seminal vesicles. Some of the cells are pretty much larger compared to the neighbors. And that is something, again, this kind of non-uniform atypia is something that you do not get in the case of a ductal adenocarcinoma. So keep that in mind. Uh, the less common entities, the less common carcinomas that you get in the prostate are urethelial carcinoma. Now, what are the settings in which you can get a urethelial carcinoma extending to the prostate? The most common setting is you have a urethelial carcinoma sitting in the bladder. So it can spread to the prostate by multiple ways. One of them, in fact, the most common way is the urethelial carcinoma creeping through the lining of the prostatic urethra and then extending beyond the lining of the prostatic urethra into the prostatic stroma. A more sinister way by which urethelial carcinoma can spread from the bladder is when it directly invades through the muscular wall of the bladder into the prostatic stroma, or maybe it has gone into the perivesical fat, and from that it has again penetrated through the capsule of the prostate and gone into the prostatic stroma. Now, the clinical implication is very, very different between the two because in the first case, you are dealing with a PT2 stage disease, while in the second, you are dealing with a PT4A stage disease. And that is something which is best, uh, I mean, which is best established by sitting with your clinician at the clinical pathological conferences and utilizing a combination of radiological findings along with your biopsy and the immunohistochemistry findings in order to establish in which stage probably the patient is. A less common way by which you can get prostatic urethral, I mean, this prostatic urethelial carcinoma happening in the prostate is if there is a primary urethelial carcinoma arising from the smaller ducts of the prostate. Now, that is a slightly less common scenario. Uh, as far as the histology is concerned, now the our primary objective should be to differentiate a pattern 5 prostatic carcinoma, which is very, very undifferentiated, mostly solid sheets, you know, solid sheets and kind of trabeculae of this prostatic atypical cells versus a urethelial carcinoma invasion. So keep in mind that if you get a significant amount of stromal desmoplasia or inflammation in association with the very poorly differentiated solid tumor, you are most likely dealing with an invasive urethelial carcinoma because a plain logic tells us that this is something foreign to the prostate, which has come into the prostate and hence it will initiate some amount of desmoplastic host reaction along with inflammation. Similarly, if you have very significant high-grade nuclei, pleomorphic nuclei, and frequent central necrosis, you are more likely to be dealing with a urethelial carcinoma rather than a solid prostatic carcinoma because a prostatic carcinoma, if you remember from our prior discussion, pleomorphism is not seen. You will usually get monomorphic cells with very prominent nucleolus. And in some cases, you can get squamous or glandular differentiation within the urethelial carcinoma component, and that will make things much more troublesome. As far as IHC is concerned, IHC is definitely a boon as far as diagnosing this particular group of tumors is concerned and differentiating them from the prostate because this will be negative for all your existing prostatic markers. Instead, they will express markers which are expected in the case of urethral carcinomas like CK7 and CK20 variably, D63 
HMWCK, GATA3, and also if your lab has Europlakin, you can also add Europlakin to the mix. We've already told about the ways in which you can have an urethral carcinoma in the prostate. And I've already discussed about the clinical significance. So if you have a direct extension into the prostatic urethra from the bladder, you are dealing with a PT2 stage disease. On the other hand, if you have a spread through the wall of the, that is through the capsule of the prostate and its muscular wall from the bladder, you are dealing with a transpural invasion. And in that case, the stage is T4A. Now there is a significant survival difference between these two ways of urethral carcinoma spread. And also keep in mind that the urethral carcinoma of the prostate has got a separate TNM staging system for it. Most importantly, it is very important to differentiate the undifferentiated prostatic adenocarcinoma from the urethral carcinoma because such cases of urethral carcinoma do not respond to androgen deprivation therapy, which is usually tried in the case of prostatic SNR carcinomas of grade group 5. And instead, they should be treated by a radical cystoprostatectomy with lymph node dissection. So clinical radiological, uh, I mean, this correlation becomes very important in these cases. So you have, in this particular case, I chose this particular case because again, uh, this highlights some of the important differential diagnostic issues that we've, uh, I mean, that we come across with this particular group of tumors. Over here, you see that the pattern is mostly solid sheets and nests with a lot of comedonecrosis within majority of these nests. Now, this much extensive comedonecrosis is usually not seen in the case of a prostatic SNR carcinoma. Also, look at the amount of desmoplasia which is happening around this nest. So that's also like something that is unusual in the case of a primary prostatic SNR carcinoma. If you look at the cells, again, the cells are really not that strikingly large. Pleomorphism is there to, uh, to a certain extent. But again, this kind of pleomorphism is not that obvious, huge degree of pleomorphism. So you would need to utilize a combination of prostatic versus urothelial markers in order to establish your diagnosis. Uh, and as I've already said, look for soft clues when you are dealing with a urothelial carcinoma mates to the prostate. First, desmoplasia, as you can see, very, very fibrocellular stroma. So there's a prominent host reaction to this nest and also a lot of inflammation so these things usually point to a spread of urethelial carcinoma into the prostate. A primary prostatic carcinoma usually doesn't have this. And of course, if you utilize high molecular weight keratins and P63, the norm for SNR carcinoma is that this will be negative for those, while urethelial carcinoma, like in this case, will express both HMWCK and P63. Also, you will have other markers like GATA3, CK7, and 20 to support you. So this was the main differential diagnosis, a poorly differentiated Gleason pattern 5 SNR carcinoma of the prostate, which has spread into the interactal component as well. So you utilize the panel of markers. HGPIN could sometimes theoretically be a diagnostic issue, especially if it is involving ducts and SNI to a large extent. But again, it's not really that common an entity that comes into the differential. Pleomorphism and mitosis that you get in the case of urethral carcinoma is not usually seen in the case of HGPIN. Coming to the this, this particular category of tumors, you know, the prostatic carcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation, if you look at the current WHO book, you will probably not find it mentioned in such an elaborate fashion. So I've just gone back to the old 2016 WHO classification because for the student who's, who is starting out uh, with prostatic pathology, I think it gives an idea it kind of gives a bird's eye view of the entire range of neuroendocrine morphologies that you can get in the setting of prostatic carcinomas. So you can have a usual prostate carcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation, which in this case is established only by immunohistochemistry. That is your synaptophysin, and chromogranin, CD56, et cetera. So that's one type. But here morphology is characteristically like your conventional prostatic SNR carcinoma. Now, in some cases, a prostatic carcinoma can have these panet cell-like cells with very bright, prominent granules within their cytoplasm. So that's another kind of neuroendocrine differentiation that you can get in a prostatic carcinoma. Tumors with the characteristic nested insular morphology of carcinoid tumor with well-differentiated tumor cells uh, are very uncommon. But if you do get them in the prostate, you will have to think from a, as of a metastasis from some other organs, probably from the colon or the setting of a men's syndrome. The next two entities are actually what is much more common in clinical practice. Uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma with a small cell morphology, that is your, I mean, that is your small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma or your large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. Uh, we shall see the histology 
in order to differentiate between the two. It's pretty easy, actually. The small cell carcinoma will have those characteristics, small to medium-sized cells with very high NC ratio, nuclear molding, crushing artifact, et cetera. While your large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma will have a nested pattern, sheet-like pattern, but the cells will be large and most importantly, nucleolus will be very prominent and there'll be often a extensive mitosis within that particular tumor. So this looks nothing like the small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. Sometimes you can get a prostatic acinar carcinoma with mixed neuroendocrine component. This is also, again, another thing which is pretty common. We shall be talking about this subsequently. And remember that most of these neuroendocrine carcinomas now are actually categorized by WHO under the category of treatment-related neuroendocrine carcinoma. This brings home an important fact that when you have neuroendocrine differentiation, like either a small cell carcinoma like morphology or a mixed SNR with small cell component, always ask the first question, has this patient had a prior chemotherapy or a radiotherapy? Because that could actually influence the, the, I mean, the subsequent prostatic biopsies. You will find a differentiation happening towards the neuroendocrine morphology. And sometimes, uncommonly, you will get a prostatic carcinoma with overlapping features of a small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma and an SNR carcinoma. So as I've already said, the new WHO classification seems to have brought all these things together under the category of treatment-related neuroendocrine prostatic carcinoma, which can be either of the small cell or the large cell neuroendocrine morphology. These usually happen within 24 months of androgen deprivation therapy. And uh, in most of the cases, you will find a component of typical prostatic SNR carcinoma along with the small cell or the large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma component. And what about the grading implication? So the small cell neuroendocrine component should not be taken into GLSEN grading, but usually it happens that most of these cases have a GLSEN score of more than, of at least eight. Uh, as far as the IHC is concerned, again, the usual rules apply. Your synaptophysin chromogranin will show variable degrees of staining, CD56 as well. TTF1, as we already know, small cell carcinomas, irrespective of site, will oftentimes show TTF1 positivity. And as a result, the rule that TTF1 means that the tumor has come from the lung or from the thyroid does not apply in the case of a small cell carcinoma. So around 50% of these cases will express TTF1 as well. And uh, so large cell neuroendocrine prostatic carcinoma and the small cell type have got a similar kind of IHC findings. And this is how they will characteristically look. Of course, you know the characteristic small cell neuroendocrine look, small to medium-sized cells with very closely packed cells, molded nuclei, scanned cytoplasm, oftentimes spindling, and along with the crush artifacts, and a kind of a nested architecture, solidness or sheets. So this is a needle biopsy where predominantly it had a small cell neuroendocrine morphology kind of a look. Of course, chromogenin and synaptophysin would be useful, but again, remember that chromogenin might not show you this kind of you know, diffuse positivity in, uh, in these cases. As we know, chromogenin is a highly specific marker, but it loses out to synaptophysin as far as the sensitivity is concerned. So you are better off utilizing synaptophysin if you are short of material. Uh, so synaptophysin will be expressed in around 84 to 89% of these cases, chromogenin in 61 to 75%. CD56, as you see, has got a pretty high amount of sensitivity, but again, it's not very specific. So probably you would focus much more on the synapto. And NSE, it was even in, the, uh, I mean, in those ancient days when I was doing my PG, it used to be jokingly called as a, as a non-specific analyst. So we do not utilize this in clinical practice much. Now, CD44, in the middle, there was a big talk about CD44 uh, being a very specific marker for small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma in the prostate, but now we know that it has failed validation studies, so it's not really considered a great marker to use. And uh, as far as the primary prosthetic markers are concerned, less than 20% of pure SC, NEC will express these markers. So oftentimes, you can have a mixed carcinoma where the small cell component is entirely negative for these primary prosthetic markers. As I've already said, 50% of them will express TTF1. And this is another, I mean, another interesting thing that we know, especially when we deal with unknown primary tumors. If you use pancytocaritin, they will have a characteristic paranuclear dot-like positivity that you see in the case of a small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. Sometimes these cells 
are not small, they are medium sized, but you will have to go by the rule of the cells having scanty cytoplasm with some amount of molding to the adjacent, uh, I mean, to their adjacent neighbors. And as discussed, you will oftentimes have a component of SNR adenocarcinoma along with the neuroendocrine carcinoma. Sometimes, rarely, you can get rosettes within this background. Synaptophysin here is strongly positive. And as I already said, PSA. So if you use PSA or sometimes even NKX 3.1, your small cell carcinoma component may turn out to be negative. And this is an important rule that also established, uh, I mean, that also uh, is known in the case of a metastasis of unknown primary. Rarely you can get a NKX 3.1 negative tumor, although NKX 3.1 is often positive. PSA in most of the cases of a of a, uh, of a metastatic prostatic cancer with neuroendocrine features will turn out to be negative. So PANSICA characteristically shows this dot-like positivity that you can appreciate in these cells. And large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, as I have already said, is this only resembles the small cell carcinoma by the kind of an organoid kind of a pattern, but the cells are much more larger and much more pleomorphic and mitotically active as in the case of a small cell carcinoma. Again, they are very strongly synaptophysin positive. Coming to the last entity of this discussion, that is carcinomas with squamous differentiation. Now, both squamous cell carcinoma and adenosquamous carcinoma can be seen in the prostate, but just like in the case of neuroendocrine carcinoma, keep in mind that many times these have got a priorly existing history of a prostatic SNR carcinoma, which have been treated by radiation or hormones. So these are more likely to be seen in those cases which are coming to you as a repeat biopsy after treatment after an adjuvant treatment. So uh, you already know how to make a diagnosis of a squamous cell carcinoma or even an adenosquamous carcinoma. I shall not be talking much about the histology in this particular cases. Keep in mind that you will oftentimes see a conventional SNR carcinoma along with either an adenosquamous architecture or a squamous cell carcinoma like a like pattern. The more important thing to keep in mind is you will have to exclude a secondary squamous cell carcinoma especially a urothelial carcinoma, which is showing divergent squamous differentiation, which is coming from the bladder. So again, there you will utilize your combination of prosthetic versus urothelial markers. And of course, another important thing that we know is that glycine grading and the grade groups are not, uh, are not applicable to the, uh, to the squamous cell component. Instead, more often you will find yourself using the broader style of uh, I mean, the style of grading that is, you will be, will be, I mean, looking for the degree of keratinization that is keratin pearl versus dyskeratosis and also the range of atypia. Uh, what about the IHC? The squamous component will be usually negative for most of the, uh, the primary prosthetic markers. Instead, it will show the usual positivity that you expect in the case of a squamous cell carcinoma, P63, CK5, 6, 34, beta, 12, CK14, etc. The glandular component, on the other hand, in the case of adenosquamous carcinoma, will be positive for prosthetic markers. It will be negative for the squamous markers. Uh, only scanned data exists as far as the NKX 3.1 positivity in the glandular component is concerned. Now, this is a case of a pure squamous cell carcinoma of the prostate with the characteristic keratinization that you are seeing in this case. And this is a adenosquamous carcinoma where again the glandular component has got highlighted by the PSA and the squamous component is picked up by the P63. So that's all about the discussions of the primary prosthetic cancers. Now with an understanding of this, uh, I mean of this diverse range of tumors, we now have enough stock in our armamentarium to talk about glissons scoring and the glissons grading system, which we shall talk about in the next discussion. Thank you.